My name is Adam Golner. I'm a writer, and I'm here in Wenatchee Valley, Washington, the Apple capital of the world. There's something strange happening here in Wenatchee, the Great Bowl. From Washington, the Fuji type of one fruit flavored with the Concord type of another yields this, also meaning wrestle. Dennis? What is Something a grapple? Gra grapple. The correct pronunciation is actually grapeple. A grapeple is an apple that tastes and smells like artificial grapes. I first came upon the Great Bull when I was researching The Fruit Hunters. The Fruit Hunters was a book that explored the world of fruits and what they mean to us. And so I was looking for stories about unusual or interesting fruit. The moment that I did hear about the Great Bull, I thought there must be a story here. On the packaging, it says apples and natural and artificial grape flavors. What exactly does that mean? The story of how it's made, according to them, is quite a, a, a simple message. They say they take this healthy Fuji or Agela apple and they dunk it in a bath of Concord grape flavor. What it says here is it says, these premium apples are the ones that take on the grape flavor best. This patented process is complex and the ingredient mix primarily includes concentrated grape flavor and pure water. It says that all the ingredients are USDA and FDA approved. There is nothing but flavor being infused into the apple. We found some grapeples and we wanted to see what people really think about it. So we took the grapeples into the streets to do some taste tests. I came across a lot of really strong reactions. Some people would say they like it, but some people really passionately dislike it. Open it up, smell them, and let us know what it's like. Okay. Very well. All right. Wow, it smells like grape soda. Yeah, straight up. It smells exactly Seriously? like grape soda. Yeah, I can taste that. A little bit of grape, and that's good. Kind of like going on a date with your grandma. It smells like you, you put Diamatap on it or something <laughs> like that. Definitely has a grape smell. <laughs> or what we think grapes smell like. What about the grapeple? Have you heard about the grapeple? Oh, that's a, that's a fake. It tastes artificial. Like, it doesn't taste like any natural fruit. How do you make an apple taste like a grape? Do you have any idea how this is done? Hey, can we give you one? I eat like the three apples today, but I open the whole and I use it as a bowl for a smoke pot. <laughs> but it's good because after you after you smoke from the apples, you get the munchies, you eat it. <laughs> so what exactly has been happening here in Washington that would allow the grapeple to become a reality? We're at the Washington Apple Commission. We're gonna go inside and find out. I'm Adam. Adam, hi, Adam. I'm Rebecca Lyons hi, Rebecca. with nice the Washington to Apple Commission. Nice to meet you. The, Wenatchee area has been involved in apple growing for about 100 years, or actually over 100 years. And that is because the Columbia River. And it's a combination of that water, uh, the sunshine that we get here. We get about 300 days of sunshine a year. And of course, the wonderful soil that comes from the fact that we're at the base of the Cascade Mountains. Those apples are hand-picked in the field and they're loaded into these big wooden bins that then go from the field, from the orchard, out of the weather as quickly as possible into the warehouse where they get it washed and then send it through to get packed. Then it will go into cold storage or into what we call controlled atmosphere storage and suck the oxygen out replace it with nitrogen, and it basically puts the apples to sleep. I would say the Red Delicious put Washington on the map of the world. That Red Delicious is iconic. That logo is famous all over the world. It starts with a sound like no other. followed by a juicy burst of sweet, refreshing flavor. Washington apples, known the world over. The apple that really put Wenatchee on the map was the Red Delicious, which throughout most of the 20th century was kind of the blockbuster star apple of America. 
Some people say that as we bread for a greater depth of redness in the Red Delicious, we actually bread the flavor out of it. And some people still like a Red Delicious, but it's also really a, quite a commercial product that spends a lot of time sitting in warehouses so that it can be available year round. Making an apple available commercially, it's a really hard thing to do. As in every industry, there's a lot of change going on. And that's, you know, that's both a blessing and a curse, as with everything. In the United States, you have a lot of variety. Consumers have so much to choose from. And there are new ones being introduced, I'm sure, <laughs> this season. They are the backbone of the central Washington area. The U.S. consumption of apples, unfortunately, is, is pretty flat, it's pretty stable. It's good we're not losing, but we're not really gaining. China is now the largest apple producing country in the world. They produce over one billion bushels or cartons of apples. And to put that into scale, last year we did 129 million. When I first started to work here in 1999, there were about 43 different shippers, and now there's 21. It is harder to make a living now than it used to be in regards to farming. Uh, it's tough. It's tough. There's a lot of a lot of small farms going by the wayside. It really, it really kind of stinks because a lot of local grown produce is kind of out the door. Uh, a lot more commercial farms. You know, that's where most of the production happens now in the United States is actually on corporate farms. With the, how hard it is for these small growers to make a living, their 10 and 20 acre plots are now housing developments. Nice to get a, a product to the marketplace. It's America. You're just trying to be an entrepreneur and figure out a way to, to make some money. Because the grapele originates in Wenatchee, we needed to find out what the current state of the apple industry is in the region. Successful growers are changing all the time. There were people that tried to cling and there still may be a few people that are trying to cling to the old way of doing things. There's not very many old-fashioned growers around anymore. I call one freckles. I could make some money on it if it had the flavor in it, but it don't. It just tastes like an apple. Can I try it? Sure. Jack Files Orchard has been in business since 1908. He's got this amazing fruit stand right next to the main road here where he grows over 200 different varieties of apples. And I'm gonna ask him what it takes to stay in business for that long. You grow a lot of different fruits. Why is that? Uh, just because it's kind of a hobby with me and I have the roadside stand where I can market it. Now I could take these varieties, over 200 varieties, down to the warehouse and they say, hey, get lost. <laughs> we just want delicious Fuji's and this is Galas. This other stuff, we don't want Spitzenberg, we don't want wine sap. So that wouldn't work in commerce, but oh, no. it, works for, it works for your model. It works for our model, yes. Because of our roadside outlet, we're getting to be known to have different varieties of apples. But look at the shape of that apple. That is a unique shape. What do you call this guy? That name is Kendall Synap. It just tastes like an apple, right? It tastes amazing. You like it? It's really good. You gotta grow what people want. If you grow even a nice apple, no matter how good it is, if people don't want it, you're gonna lose money. <laughs> Only perfection gets through. So people shop with their eyes. And uh, we've had marketing studies where they put unpolished, unwaxed fruit on the shelf in the store, the pretty ones sell. And that's a sad fact. So in order to sell the 250 million box of apples that sell in the United States every year, quality has to be there. The successful grower is someone who's dynamic and is ready to change when change is due, and he has to be looking ahead 10 years. We're at Washington State University's Tree Fruit Research Center. We're gonna to speak to apple breeder Kate Evans to find out how to create the perfect apple. What do you have here? Some WA-38s. Oh, these are the WA-38s? They are. This is the future of the apple itself, <laughs> quite possibly? I hope so, yes. All right, we're going down to the lab. I have to tell you that I do not eat apples for pleasure anymore. After 20 years of eating apples for work, I prefer to go home and eat something quite different. <laughs> the breeding program focus is to 
produce new, improved varieties of apple that are specifically selected for the growing conditions of central Washington. This is actually a WA38. But what makes it so special? So the thing uh, for me about this apple is its crispness. So this has a, a, an initial crispness, it's very similar to Honeycrisp, but it retains that crispness. It's crisp as you continue to eat all the way through. Amazing texture. Nice and juicy. This is a great <laughs> apple. It's not bad, is it? We're actually struggling to find things that are wrong with this apple. How hard was it to make this apple? Well, this apple was made from a cross uh, in 1997. It's been around for a while, but that gives you some idea of the length of the, the breeding program. Everything that goes into getting a fruit from the field or the orchard to market is so complicated, and there's so much that goes into industrial agriculture that we never hear about. So the grapele kind of tied into that. How did they breed the grapele? This isn't a... a a product of a breeding program. This is a product of having a grape um, flavor infused into a, oh, wow, yes, infused into <laughs> just a, a normal apple. Would we be able to, at some <laughs> point this morning, have you try it? Um, uh, probably not, no. <laughs> The apple industry over the past couple of decades has faced some major challenges, and one of them is that other countries have started growing apples on a huge scale. In order to stay relevant in the world of apples, growers have been forced to evolve in whatever ways they can. That could mean selling crunch packs or pre-sliced apple packages, or even making a product like the grapele. The Snyder Brothers at C&O Nursery in Wenatchee invented the grapele. They've sold millions and the company is thriving. My daughter was younger and my son was younger. They actually really liked these. But when you get to the crunch pack scenarios and you get to these scenarios, it's just a marketing scenario to try to continue to get more return on your investment. It's, it's a, a fantastic way to do it because you're marketing something that somebody wants. I'm going to guess it's around a 4 or $5 deal for four apples. It's an ingenious marketing tool. I met Gary Snyder several years ago when I was researching the Fruit Hunters. I flew out to Wenatchee to go meet with him. He was kind of waffling about letting me come and do the interview. On the one hand, he wanted to have some press for his invention, but on the other hand, he was quite reluctant to talk about how it's made. But in the end, he agreed for me to come and interview him, and I, I asked if he would show me where they make the grapele, and he said, you know, no way on God's green earth am I gonna let you anywhere near that factory. But he did agree to show me where they grow their apples. And the second I got there, I thought, it smells really powerfully like purple Kool-Aid. And he furthered my confusion by wanting me to think that the smell was coming off of him. So he started saying, well, you know, the solution is very powerful, and when you get it on your clothes, it'll spread the smell to all your other clothes. As we were leaving, he drove away first, and I held back for a moment. And I rolled down the windows, and it still smelled like artificial grapes there. And so the scent was definitely at the orchard. It wasn't only coming off of him. One of the things he was quite clear about is that there was no epiphany that led to this apple being created. There was no eureka moment. His secretiveness just made me more curious about what was going on there. I realized that I had no idea what artificial grape flavor actually is. I decided to look into that. Artificial grape flavor is technically called methyl anthranolate. Methyl anthranolate is used as a flavoring agent in medicines, chewing gum, Kool-Aid, popsicles, lollipops, grape soda. Is it in any other products? Turns out to be a good bird repellent. So most people at home don't really know how hard it is to grow an apple and get it out there to consumers. Sure. Is it easy or is it complicated? Um, it's, I wouldn't say complicated, but there's a lot of process. You know, we have a multitude of outside things like uh, birds and deer and animals that actually inhabit the orchards because where we live, there's a lot of outside influence. Now, is it true that 
Some farmers here spray the smell of artificial grapes to keep birds away? We were just talking about that because um, we're cherry growers. Okay. And so there were a few years there where you sprayed a grape concentrate on the cherry so the birds would not take a bite out of your cherries, and it worked. Bird Shield, what is this? Bird Shield is a, a, it's actually a grape concentrate product that we spray on. We'll take this material and put it through a fogger. Is this a pesticide? Uh, technically speaking, if it has an EPA number, it is a pesticide. And you couldn't just, you couldn't just put it into something and, and drink it because it wouldn't be safe. EPA right? number means it's been registered with the Environmental Protection Agency and it has been tested to show that it won't have issues or problems within the parameters that are on the label guidelines. And does it work? Uh, it does. We have a lot of growers that, that use this. It seems so strange, but I guess the pieces were starting to fall together. So I called Bird Shield. They explained that their product can be used on a variety of crops, particularly Fuji apples and Gala apples, which are the two apples that are used to make grapele. Do you think that it's conceivable that they got the idea for this by... From this? From this? Well, to be honest, this is kind of patented, so I'm not exactly sure what they do in the process. Um, I know that it's got natural and artificial grape flavor that they, that they use, and this actually has some carriers in it too. Hello, is Todd Snyder there, please? Even though I'd interviewed the Snyder brothers in the past, I still thought it would be worth making another effort to speak with them this time around. They declined to let us interview them. So that was Todd Snyder from CNO Nursery. He went to vice.com based on the content he saw there. He no longer wants to be interviewed by us. So he wouldn't tell us how the grapele is made. He said that it's a secret process that is patented and protected by patent laws. Maybe there's a way to find out what it really is. We've been trying to learn more about this apple that tastes and smells like grapes, the grapele. And you've had a chance to look into the patent. Can you tell us what you found? Sure. And to be clear, what I find in the four corners of the patent in no way necessarily mean that a company the inventor or anyone is practicing or intends to practice any of these inventions. It just could be something they had in their, their minds and could potentially carve some novel patent claims on it. That being said, the process you've described in here, there's many, but at a very high level, it's the concept of dipping an apple or sometimes a pear, but they call it a post-harvest apple in the claims, but elsewhere they describe it as like a palm fruit. They dip it or otherwise apply this admixture to it for a certain amount of time in various types of ways, various admixtures, such that this admixture can in some way permeate through the skin of the fruit, but in such a way that will impart this great flavor. <laughs> okay, this is really technical so far. But in column three, it says, for the below listed examples, the preferred admixture included an off-the-shelf 26.4% solution of methyl anthranolate as manufactured by Bird X Inc. of Chicago, Illinois, USA, and marketed under the names of Bird Shield trademark, Bird Repellent, and Fruit Shield Repellent. They say that that could be a preferred one. There may be other ways for them to obtain the admixture, but in the examples that they describe, it's clear the admixture that they're using to apply to the fruit varies between 1% methylanthranolate admixture and 2%, 3%, 4%. There's this other line in here that, that's so it's such a, I find it such beautiful writing. For the present invention, the heretofore considered repellent effects of the methyl anthranolate are preserved for consumer enjoyment. That would suggest to me that they, I mean, they're aware that the methyl anthranolate has bird repellent characteristics. And as we just showed in the background, they say that another use for it is to repel birds. Would that not suggest that they got the idea for this by noticing that the bird repellent was the same thing as what's in our soft drinks or in our food products, and therefore let's preserve that for consumer enjoyment? How they made the, the jump from saying, oh wow, look, it's recognized as safe for use in food products and it's also used as a repellent for birds, and then this jump to saying that we can preserve the effects of the methylene thermolate for consumer enjoyment, I don't know how they made that jump, but it, it does say what you just read, and, I, and I'm reading it again now. <laughs> again, I, I don't mean to seem like a lawyer, lawyer. but I am. Um, it's I it's it. like a deposition. I know, like, so yeah. what you're saying, essentially, is that even though they describe how they make it in this patent, 
We have no way of knowing how they're making it. Yeah, I mean, just my knowledge based on the patent, I have no idea that they even are making it. I, I, they may it, not even be making it. Yeah, if you say they are, you know, I take your word for it, but just because the product's on the shelf doesn't mean that you, ha you can look to the patent office system to figure out how that product's made. I imagine for food, at least I had assumed and hoped that sometimes the ingredients would lead to tell you how it's, it's made in some way. They say that methylanthranolate, also known in various other things, has, has uses in both food and horticultural sciences. As a flavoring agent, this methylanthranolate is generally recognized as safe, or in quotes, GRAS, for use in food products. At the end of all of this research into methylanthranolate and artificial flavors, I found myself more confused than I was at the beginning. For the consumer, it's a total mystery of how something is regulated. Is it a food ingredient, like wheat flour? Is it a food additive, um, like olestra? Is it a grass substance like sugar or salt? Well, in 1958, Congress passed a law that was seen as extremely important back then that required better testing of food ingredients. And Congress divided food ingredients into two. One is food additives, where companies would have to submit petitions with lots of scientific data that the FDA would analyze and then either say yes or no. The other category was called grass, generally recognized as safe. And that was intended for things that were unquestionably safe, like salt and sugar and vinegar and so on. But it's turned out that some of those ingredients are not safe, even though they were very widely used. And there are probably several thousand of those substances that are either never evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and others that have been vetted to some extent. The grass part of the law doesn't even require companies to tell the Food and Drug Administration when they're introducing something new to the food supply. And that's a terrible loophole that ought to be changed by Congress. But when you look at all the grass substances that we know of, the real risks come from three substances, sugar, fat, and partially hydrogenated oil they're still considered by the government to be generally recognized as safe, even though everybody in the government knows that at the levels consumed, they're dangerous. Those are the killers. At the end of this story, all I can say is that I'm more confused than I was at the beginning. I have no idea whether the grapele is unwholesome or not, or whether it's healthy or whether it's fine. And as I tried to get clear answers, what I found was more questions and increasing confusion to the point where I just really have no idea what's in any of the food that I eat. I can totally understand why they wouldn't want to speak to a journalist about how the grapele is made. And it isn't necessarily because there is something unhealthy about it, but rather just because speaking about artificial grape flavors that also double as bird repellents isn't a good look. However, if it is something that we are going to be feeding to our children, the public still deserves to know a little bit more of what is in something like the grapele. It's a metaphor for what's happening with our entire food system. So we went to the herb farm to meet with the owners and the sommelier and the chef there to see what they would think about the grapele. The herb farm is considered to be one of the birthplaces of eating local and seasonal food in America. So you have places like Chez Panisse and the herb farm. They had this incredible spread of heirloom apples laid out for us, like the finest tasting apples known to man. And we brought them grapes. <laughs> Very perfumey. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Ew. I'm sorry. It reminds me of the like the toothpaste they, they get you to use when you're really little so that you'll brush your teeth. Yep. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also really hungry. <laughs> All right. <we'll> <laughs> Why do people want artificial flavors. I think a lot of kids are eating things that taste like this. They're, they're growing up on uh, processed foods. They're growing up on Hot Pockets, you know, and things like that. This is just uh, what people might be used to. I don't think the kids want something like this. I think the parents might think they might want something like this. Is it better to 
not have a grapele and let the Chinese grow all of our apples, or is it better to keep our orchards even if we have to have grapels? The herb farm people brought up some of the bigger, more complex questions surrounding the grapele. Maybe this is a good thing if it means that people are actually eating apples. Maybe it can help farmers. Maybe it's something that does have a place, given what our supermarkets are full of already. Honestly, I don't know much about the grapple or grapple, whatever you want to call it. People have made money on it. People like an apple that tastes like a grape. If people like it, they buy it, you make money, that's what it's all about. Grow to it. You do what you have to do to stay alive, you know? One of the things that I found interesting about Wenatchee is that it's almost like this it's just sprawl. Like the whole town is a suburb that is lined with these fast food chains. There's something about that that seems like a reflection of the grapple. It's not what we really think about when we think about an apple orchard. It's like, it's an industrial place. It comes out of this, the, the circumstances that the apple industry has found itself in, which is challenges and needing to evolve.